Our world is on fire. This phrase, which was once figurative to describe the heating planet, is now quite literal. This summer, Western North America is experiencing record-breaking heat waves linked to the burning of fossil fuels driving the climate crisis. These record-breaking temperatures, combined with no rain days, have sparked more deadly wildfires this season than any in recorded history. In British Columbia alone, wildfires have burned more than three times the area that they usually burn by this time of year, proving fatal to hundreds of people and endangering frontline communities, firefighters, and animals. Folks from Interior BC have been making their plea on social media, but if you do have vacation plans in the region or know anyone who does, please reconsider changing those plans so that they can allocate resources and space to those being evacuated. But what we experience on land also has implications in the ocean. Marine heat waves can either be multi-year periods with abnormally high temperatures, like the 2014 to 2017 heating event, or short-term acute disturbances where temperatures rise rapidly in a matter of days. Just this summer, the record-breaking heat dome literally cooked alive billions of animals on the coastline of the Salish Sea. And moving down into deeper parts of the ocean, marine heat waves impact all kinds of other plants, animals, and ecological processes. These kinds of heat waves have been forecasted for years, and future predictions show that they'll likely be more frequent and extreme with major implications for everyone that relies on the ocean, which is all of us. In this episode of the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center Climate Action Series, we'll dip our toes into the warming waters to explore how marine heat waves impact coastal communities and biodiversity, how people and animals are adapting to extreme heat, and discuss what we can do to take action as we face this head on. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us for episode two of the BMSE Climate Action Series. We're excited to have you here today as we dive into the very topical subject of marine heat waves. It's been a hot summer, and I don't know about you, but like many other people, I love talking about the weather, and not just in a small talk kind of way. I legit wanted to be a meteorologist at one point. That was until I realized Chasing storms and looking at clouds were not the main job responsibility. All jokes aside, the heat waves we've seen this summer and in the past few years are without a doubt deadly and linked to the climate crisis. On top of a global pandemic, hundreds of people have died from extreme heat events. Roads and transit lines literally fell apart. And the stagnation of warming water bodies impacts clean drinking water. In this episode, we weren't able to have our guests join us live, but we were lucky enough to speak with them beforehand. And we still encourage you to ask your questions using the Q&A Zoom function, so we can ask Dr. Chris Harley or Dr. Sally Lees in the podcast. To kick off this episode, we decided to start at home and talk to community members in our own remote coastal community of Bamfield and ask folks how they've been impacted by marine heat waves and what we can expect to see going forward. We're now talking to Angela at Nova Harvest. Angela, could you go ahead and let us know who you are and what you do at Nova Harvest? Hi, uh, thanks. Yeah, I'm Angela, I'm a hatchery manager here at Nova Harvest. So we're a shellfish um, hatchery and we also have a farm as well. 
as we grow very tiny oysters and clams for uh, shellfish farmers all over BC. And so has any of your operations been affected by the marine heat wave or shellfish farming in general? Yeah, um, yeah, the last few uh, and more extreme heat waves have caused some like minor inconveniences. Um, like we, this machine behind us, we grow microalgae. Um, so ones that we don't have temperature control over um, do cause cultures to crash. Uh, it's not a totally devastating thing, but it's, it's annoying and a thing that we now have to kind of plan um, on how to have temperature control within the hatchery. Uh, the more kind of extreme things that um, effects of it is for the farmers. And so there's some farmers around BC who during the heat waves, um, that last really extreme heat wave coincided with a lot of um, really low tides, uh, summer tides, mm. uh, which meant if their farms were on the beaches, mm -hmm. uh, they saw increased mortalities. So some farmers um, reporting up to 80% of their uh, farm dying um, and some pretty huge financial losses. Uh, so that's kind of a scary thing to think about with like if these heat waves will be mm. increasing in frequency over summers in the future as well and like how to adapt and plan for that. We're now talking to Em, a researcher at Simon Fraser University who studies nutrient cycling. Hi Em. Hey Neri, how's it going? Good! So what is nutrient cycling? Nutrient cycling is actually driven by animals, which is really exciting. So animals eat food and they store nutrients in their body, but they also pee nutrients out again, which makes them available for other processes. And is this process of nutrient cycling in any way being affected by marine heat waves? Yes, absolutely. So with this animal mediated nutrient cycling, you need animals. So with the heat wave having killed off billions or millions of animals uh, in the ocean, that's going to affect the nutrient cycling. So I actually study subtitle animals and nutrient cycling underwater, and those weren't as dramatically affected, at least not the same way that the animals living on shore, those intertidal animals were affected, but the loss of all those mussels and barnacles and all those critters on the shore will absolutely affect the nutrient cycling of the ocean. We're now joined by Claire, a researcher from Dalhousie University who studies kelp bryozoan interactions. Claire, first question, what is a bryozoan? Yes, for sure, it's, a, it's an animal, it's a colonial invertebrate. So it lives as repeated units in one colony and they can take a variety of forms uh, that are freestanding or encrusting. So how do bryozoans and kelp interact with each other? Yes, so specifically in the research that I've been doing with the Metaxas lab back on the east coast of Canada, we're looking at an encrusting bryozoan that's called Membranipra membranacea. Here on the west coast, it is in its native range, but on the Atlantic coast, it's an invaded region. So it's a species that will grow and encrust onto the blades of kelps, and this will actually weaken the kelp tissues and it enhances their probability of breakage during storms or other periods of wave action. So it can be sustainable as long as it's regulated within the ecological community by consumers, much like it can be here on the West Coast. But on the East Coast, in the lack of uh, consumers, it can very much go unregulated and it can cause substantial losses in the kelp assemblages. And are kelp or bryozoans somehow affected by marine heat waves in any way? Both could very much be, both have relationships to temperature that would be affected. Uh, the bryozoan specifically, Membranipra membranacea, it's been shown that its life history stages, such as when it's a young juvenile and when it's an adult colony, are both positively influenced by increased temperatures. So as we see more and more years with heat waves, with temperature anomalies relating to our changing trajectory of climate, it's very likely that we're going to see changes in the population dynamics and in the distributions of this species, both in its invasive and potentially even in its native range. We're now joined by Tom Campbell at Cascadia Seaweed. Hey Tom, if you won't mind introducing yourself and let us know a bit about what you do here. Yeah, sounds good. So my name's Tom and I work at Cascadia Seaweed. And Cascadia Seaweed was founded in 2018. And since then it's grown from its three original founders to a team of over 20 individuals. And our goal is to be the largest provider of ocean cultivated seaweed in North America. 
And I'm the conservation biologist, and um, one of my main responsibilities is working here in our nursery, producing our kelp seed for our kelp farms, as well as developing new methodologies for that, um, exploring some, some different methods for producing green gravel, which is an exciting kelp restoration method, and developing a gametophyte bank. What kind of kelps do you grow here? So mainly we're growing Saccharina latissima, also known as sugar kelp, and Elaria marginata, known as winged kelp. And those are the two main species that we grow at our farms. But this spring and summer, we've been experimenting growing some other species like Macrocystis, uh, and we're gonna continue doing that work into the future, you know, experimenting with new species. Were your operations or your research affected by the marine heat wave recently or other marine heat waves? Um, you know, marine heat waves are, they're devastating events for coastal ecosystems. Um, they have long lasting effects and often the uh, ecological implications, you know, they have socioeconomic uh, consequences as well. Um, so any, any company that's reliant on healthy uh, marine ecosystems um, is going to have to learn how to adapt to these marine heat waves. Um, we're ocean farmers, we're kelp farmers, and kelp requires cold nutrient waters, nutrient rich waters mm -hmm. to grow. Um, and marine heat waves are a challenge for, for kelps. Um, there's been a lot of research going on all over the world documenting the effect of marine heat waves on kelp species. And, uh, you know, m most notably, we've observed that marine heat waves lead to their decline. Um, so, you know, re requiring specific oceanographic conditions for our farms, we're keeping a close eye on that. We monitor oceanographic conditions like temperature and nutrients at our farm sites uh, and try and stay on top of marine heat waves and adjust our operations accordingly. Our first guest today is Dr. Sally Lees. Sally is a professor at the University of Alberta in the Department of Biological Sciences. Her lab's work on marine sponges includes studying the many things sponges do without electrical signaling or conventional nerves, the ecology of glass sponge reefs right off the coast of BC, and looking at the physiology and tissues of sponge sensory cells as adult sponges and during development. If you want to learn more about sponges beyond the foundation of SpongeBob SquarePants, we highly recommend checking out the FAQ page on her webpage. We'll drop that in the show notes for you. But lucky us, we got to sit down with Sally and ask her some of our own questions about sponges and observations she's made in response to marine heat waves. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what you do, Sally? Yes, yeah, sure. I'm, um, I'm out here to look at um, a particular lava from a sponge. So I'm uh, working on coordination systems, so how animals got their nervous systems. So that's really the, the, um, the thing that uh, drives our research. And for that, I'm mostly uh, looking at sponges because they don't have nervous systems and uh, understanding how they behave and um, you know what they do to um, make a living and reproduce and, um, and so on. So yeah, that's what most of my group works on. And so a lot of people might think sponge and think SpongeBob SquarePants. From my understanding, they're a very basic animal. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what is a marine sponge? So Squ SpongeBob SquarePants has really been the charismatic creature. <laughs> um, and uh, it's brought you know, these more to life. And the thing is that they are, um, when you say basic, they, um, they don't behave in real time. Mm. Um, and so that's why you don't think that they do a lot. Um, they filter water and they do that actively in real time. If you put dye on them, you would see it come shooting out the top. Um, so they suck out bacteria from the water and they, they do that super efficiently. Um, they also um, reproduce and they have a lot of uh, surface area so they are filled with creatures um, and those creatures are eaten by everything else and, and so it's this big ecosystem that lives in a sponge. And you have some sponges here next to you. Do you want to tell us a bit about why they're on ice and maybe if sponges are affected by marine heat waves or changes in temperatures? Yeah, I mean, this is an, an, a very interesting question. Um, my work is really about their basic um, biology. And you need to know about their basic biology to know how that might change under a heat wave. So I really couldn't tell you mm -hmm. um, if, if this sponge was affected by um, a heat wave because I didn't do those experiments. Um, however, this is a sponge, um, and I, 
I'm going to risk pulling a little one up for you to see. Um, and I don't know if you can see it. So there it is, little tiny tube. Um, and it lives on uh, the pilings under the docks or on the shelf um, around. It lives as shallow as 30 feet. You will not find it in the shallower water. Mm. So to get it, I have to hang things down to 30 feet. You can haul everything up, but they're only at the bottom. Mm. And so there's two reasons it might live there. One is um, light. Um, and so the, the question is how far light penetrates. And we have looked at that. And mm. um, the water's very dark here, green. You know, It's not very clear. Um, and they spawn in the, winter, in the summertime when it's particularly murky. So I'm not sure that light is the limit but certainly the thermocline is also down to there. So I suspect that it's a combination of, of those two things. Um, when I want to get the larvae from it, so the little babies, the mm -hmm. rep uh, reproducing um, bits, I put them in these um, bowls here on the light because um, they have a photoreceptor. So I think that they actually are uh, triggered to be released by light, possibly by um, the timing of light over the course of the previous day. It's mm -hmm. quite complicated. In wow. fact, yeah, a lot of these animals use clock genes. So they, um, those genes are turned on, and then it, it sets a, a thing in progress by which th something's released the next day. Corals do the same thing. Yep. Um, and so I put them out here, and I'm pretty sure in mid-afternoon they're going to be doing it, which is why I think it's a, a clock system. Ah. Um, and in order that they don't warm up, I have them on ice, because the seawater is about what well, should be around nine degrees. Um, and as soon as I bring them up in the surface water, it's too warm. So I have to keep them in cold water for that spawning. Ah, interesting. So, yeah, so temperature um, definitely has an effect. So one of the ways we make um, all kinds of invertebrates spawn is to stress them. Okay. So if you want to look at um, development in, in um, marine invertebrates, you can stress them in different ways. And one way to stress them is a heat shock. So ah. to get something to spawn, you would um, put it in warmer water, a little bit warmer, not cooking it, but right. slightly warmer, and it will spawn. So all of those sort of um, natural history, uh, basic biology bits of knowledge suggest that they're not going to be happy just in warmer water like I might be. You're so observant in so many other animals beyond sponges. What are some of the other observations that you've noticed in the area with increasing temperatures or heat waves. Yeah, so these are, um, these are troublesome times for the marine biologist. Um, when I collect these sponges, they're on ropes that I have strung down so that any student can go pull them up and you don't have to dive. It's really convenient, except in the last three years, the ropes are covered in an ascidian. We would call it, um, so this is a, a slimy creature that is colonial and it hangs down with long strands and it literally coats everything. It's something from a, a movie. Interesting. Um, and it is also a filter feeder. Um, it is a very big space consumer. So basically there's a lot less space for my creatures or the sponges or other um, invertebrates that I'm actually interested in. So that's a, that's that has been a really obvious um, big change and I would guess that this is probably found further south and now can extend its range and so on. Um, so they, they're very reproductive and um, so they won't have trouble filling up our coast. And is there a link between temperature changes even at depth and areas of the ocean that are oxygen, oxygen depleted like anoxic zones? Well there is because um, so what we get, the reason we have these anoxic zones, um, and they have been there off our uh, Pacific coast for a very long time, because we have a huge amount of productivity in the surface water that then um, gets eaten and chewed and sinks. And as it sinks down, bacteria eat it, and that uses up the oxygen. Right. And so you end up with um, a very rich amount of material that comes down and then just becomes um, uh, absent of, of oxygen and then it increases in oxygen much further down as it gets replenished from the deep water. Right. So it's sort of a pocket. Hmm. Um, and a lot of animals do okay in it. Um, Amanda Kahn, who, um, who you know was a student of mine, she's down at, at Moss Landing Marine Labs and, and has done a lot of work off the coast um, uh, looking at oxygen uh, used by these an animals and many of them can tolerate that right. but they're adapted to it. Right. They work in that little range that right. they're used to, you know. Now you try to take that 
habitat of oxygen and move it into an area where animals are actually not used to that. And that is really where um, the problem comes in. So um, that area of lower oxygen is increasing because we have more warmer events that are causing more oxygen consumption. Right. And so that's that bulge is really going to affect things. Um, so even for example, for some animals that might be able to withstand, withstand those anoxic areas, what are some of the indirect effects that they might experience? So I was contemplating that. Um, I think that it's interesting, I look at the oxygen use by a sponge uh, as one of the things we're looking at, metabolism of these, these creatures um, to, to understand how they function. And they use very little oxygen um, to actually filter. Uh, a very efficient little system. And the glass sponges on our coast, mm. I mean, they remove so little oxygen, you just think, wow, this can almost live in outer space, right? right? It's like it doesn't need any oxygen. Very little. The thing is that it lives with a range of creatures, a huge number of animals that um, it actually relies on for food. Right. So the sponge is filtering out bacteria that is uh, growing on poop and um, material that's that's produced by this range of crabs and and um, slugs, um, fish and little tiny crustaceans that are running around it, um, and those will have different oxygen tolerances. And in in my experience, when I've been diving here on the coast you can get periods when a, a deeper region, like where I used to dive with the boot sponges, suddenly becomes um, filled with fungus. It's like dead, a bacterial mat. Oh. And I don't know, because we didn't used to have temperature gauges and oxygen gauges around those, but um, those sponges don't exist there anymore. And it's quite likely, because it's relatively shallow, that the temperatures, the pulses of, of warmer water and who knows? I don't think it's necessarily oxygen, but I don't know. Right. Um, would have affected those. So, yeah. So all these changes, even though it's out of sight or deeper water. It's terrifying. It still has happened. Yeah. It's terrifying for the marine biologist, I have to tell you. Yeah. That's why we're keeping on monitoring, studying, see what's happening, yeah. what's changing, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. We're holding out hope for sponges and all the other critters out there but we appreciate you sharing today. They, considering the amount of larvae they produce, I think there's hope. Okay. So they're resilient. We have hope for yeah. sponges. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Our second guest today is Dr. Christopher Hartley from UBC. Chris has been studying marine ecosystems along the Pacific coast since 1995. After completing his PhD in 2001, he's worked in labs associated with Stanford University and the University of California, Davis. In 2005, he joined UBC and is now a full professor cross-appointed in the Department of Zoology and the Institute of the Oceans and Fisheries. Chris and his students study ecological responses to climate change, including ocean acidification, warming, and altered salinity. And some of their recent work includes studying the spatial scales and migration of key species in response to environmental changes. His name may sound familiar to you if you've been following the news lately, as he's been highly involved in media interviews around the heat dome. So we're so lucky to have him with us today. Chris, thanks for joining us. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Well, it is a pleasure to be a part of this series, and I want to share with you what my students and I have seen on the shores of British Columbia since the big heat dome that we had in late June of this year. And the reason for the, well, that stunk title is twofold. Uh, on the one hand, it stunk for people. A, a lot of people died. Um, a lot of us that uh, lived through it were extremely uncomfortable in air conditioned uh, 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 housing. Uh, and it literally stunk on the shoreline because so many plants and animals were killed in those three hot days that you could smell the beach from the street. You didn't even have to be down on the shore at low tide to know that something had gone wrong. And I have studied rocky shores on uh, the west coast of North America for a long time, since the mid-90s, and I've been through some heat waves in that time, and I have even recorded some mortality events 
uh, on the you know the outer coast of Washington, the outer coast of California, and even Bamfield had a small die off uh, in 2007. But we had not had a heat wave quite like the one that we had this June. This is a map, you may have seen this one or something similar, that just shows how far above quote unquote normal temperatures were on the hottest day of the heat wave, which was June 28th. And if you can see that scale bar on the right, that gets up to just ridiculous values. 20 degrees C above the long-term average is I, I mean, even the meteorologists didn't know what to say when this happened. Their Twitter feed was was funny to, to read because they just didn't know how to even put this into words. And I've I've marked Lytton, B.C. on the map because, I mean, it was something that if written in a novel, you would not have believed that this town would have set Canadian records on three consecutive days, been hotter than Las Vegas had ever been, and then on the fourth day burned down from a wildfire, which was um, also more likely to happen because of the heat. Uh, you can also see, in addition to the interior, the coast is quite a bit warmer than normal. Uh, and that is what I was very interested in. So the, the first day of the heat wave, I was uh, still living in blissful ignorance and uh, didn't really spend any time on the shore other than just coincidentally as the tide was dropping. And I took a few photos, but I was not thinking to myself, boy, I bet everything that I'm taking a photo of today is going to be dead within 48 hours. But in some cases, that might have been true. The second day, I went down to a beach near my house, and that was when the smell hit, and I knew that, okay, it's time to get out and collect some data and figure out how bad this was. And so uh, an undergraduate uh, who works in my lab this summer and I grabbed all of our fancy thermometers of science and went out to this shoreline in West Vancouver. This is in Lighthouse Park uh, with the aim of measuring the body temperatures of mussels. And we got out there and realized that this was a bit of a fool's errand because the mussels that I was interested in were the ones in the sun and the mussels in the sun were already dead. And there was no real point in measuring the body temperature of a deceased mussel. Uh, this photograph is taken on that really hot day and you can see how many mussels there are and there's, you can, uh, if you're sharp eyed, you can make out Carter, uh, the student there sort of in the middle. Um, it doesn't look that bad, right? Uh, but what if you look at it using thermal imagery? That's when you see how hot it actually was. Uh, in the you know few decades that I've been uh, measuring temperature on the shore, I can in British Columbia or Washington get temperatures into the mid 40s, occasionally the high 40s. Uh, the values to look at in this thermal image are the scale bar on the right, which show the minimum and the maximum of values for that image. So um, the water uh, was cool at around 18 degrees, and some of the rocks were up into the 50s. And if you look in the mussel bed, some of the shells of the mussels were even hotter than that. We weren't going, we had this, we were borrowing this camera. We weren't looking for the hottest point and then taking a picture of it. We were just taking a few pictures while sweating profusely and then retreating to the shade uh, and eating frozen grapes. So, so we weren't ch cherry picking these, these photos that we only had about five of them uh, of the mussel bed. And this is the hottest of those five, but I suspect there are plenty of other areas that would have been at least this hot. And I never thought we'd see a temperature in the mid fifties in the mussel bed in British Columbia in my lifetime. And uh, this would be sort of one of the themes of this event uh, in terms of what it's taught me is, you know, my, my students and I have tried to simulate heat waves in the field by using, you know, propane heaters or turkey fryers or, you know, whatever creative techniques we can. And a student was actually scheduled to go out with her propane heaters on this day. And the temperature she was simulating for the future were not as hot as it got during this heat wave that we had this summer. Okay. So it was really hot. What does that mean for all the plants and animals that live on the shore? Well, there were a lot of things that died. Uh, so wandering around, you could find dead sea stars um, like the, the Pisaster in the upper left, the leather star on the upper right that had been out in the sun and could not retreat to, to cooler, um, damper microhabitats. So a lot of those animals died. Uh, that's a kelp crab in the middle. 
Uh, there was one site near White Rock where there are a lot of them that hang out in this sort of very low intertidal pool formed by a sandbar and they breed in there. Uh, and that pool got so hot that they cooked, metaphorically speaking. Um, a lot of clams died, uh, uh, sh other shore crabs, bottom middle, bottom right, that's Nucella, a dog whelk. So lots and lots of different species um, died. But, but this group uh, I'm describing as some mortality because they either have a lot of their population that lives in places like deeper water um, or uh, were able to hide underneath of rocks. And because uh, most of these things at least are at least somewhat mobile and they're not as dumb as you might think invertebrates could be, um, they will uh, retreat to microhabitats in response to a, a, a hot low tide the previous day. Uh, so a lot of these things actually made it through. You would still find more dead ones than, than normal. The things that really got hammered, though, were things that can't move and can't hide. And those are things that are attached directly to the rock. And the especially important ones are those that form habitat. So that's rockweed on the left, uh, the seaweed fucus for, for you um, phycology nerds mussels in the center and those ones you can see have cooked and there's still tissue in place. I mean, this is the way you get them when they're served to you in a restaurant. They've been cooked and they, they open. Uh, and then barnacles on the right. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, each of these. Uh, so uh, mussels were the first indicator of the catastrophe, really, because they open up right away. Uh, so on the left, that's that's in Vancouver near my house, a lot of dead mussels in the foreground, the city skyline at the background on the right, that's Porto Cove up in House Sound, um, dead, just, you know, hectares worth of mussel bed at, at a site uh, impacted by by this heat wave. But to really get the visceral sense, uh, I want to to show you what it's like to walk along a mussel bed on a shore on Galliano Island. And I'm hoping that the sound will come through of the crunch. That's not normal. Uh, usually walking across a mussel bed when the mussels are all alive, they're, you know, they're holding themselves together. They can support your weight and they don't make any noise. And so this is sort of this weird reminder that you're walking through a cemetery and you can't avoid stepping on the, the gravestones, basically. Uh, and this particular spot um, was about the same area as a tennis court. Um, and I'm trying to remember the exact estimate, but it, based on you know quadrat scale sampling, it was about a million mussels died in an area just the size of that tennis court. And you can see that the shoreline just goes and goes and goes. Um, the patterns uh, within a shore were interesting, though. Um, that particular one had a big flat area where almost everything in the mussel bed died. Um, other shores, like the Lighthouse Park shore that you've already seen a photo of, are a little bit more complex. There's more heterogeneity there. Um, so you have a combination of sunny spots and shady spots, you know, north-facing walls, which might not get so bad. Uh, and this is another one of those um, sort of smoking guns indicating that it was temperature that caused this die off and not some other unexplained phenomenon. Um, the graph here shows whether or not uh, a particular surface was in the sun or in the shade, and uh, that's illustrated by the angle of the incoming sunlight. So 90 degrees means if you lay down on your back on that rock and look straight in front of you, you would see the sun. Um, and then these uh, smaller angles are, are angling further and further away from that until you hit um, zero degrees, and that is sort of the edge of shade, and then anything beyond that is in the shade. And we can um, very easily estimate the percent of mussels that died in that surface layer of the mussel bed. And if you were in the sun as a mussel, that was very nearly a death sentence, at least around Vancouver. Uh, and it wasn't until you got to near shade or actual shade in the uh, sort of afternoon of this hot day um, that the uh, mortality dropped down to um, around zero. So the decision those mussels made as larvae as to where they should attach was really important, it turns out, um, at the end of June, because if they attached on a north facing wall, they probably survived. If they attached on a nice sunny south facing slope, um, they uh, were much less fortunate.
And you can actually see the way that plays out on certain rocks. This is up on the Sunshine Coast um, uh, and the south facing side of the rock is on the right and it's largely bare. Um, the north facing side is covered in mussels and, and, and seaweeds. That was from last summer. Uh, here's the same rock this year and you can see how much um, all these barnacles have died. This is where the mussels used to be and they've died. So it's only this really truly north facing shady spot that, that um, saw survival. Well, but this leads in nicely to what happened to the seaweeds. Uh, they do bleach in ways that you can tell the damage has been done. All that rust color is um, no longer photosynthetic and is, is essentially dead tissue. That's not going to recover. But you can see there's a mix of live and dead tissue in, in this image. The problem is a lot of the dead or at least damaged tissue is right at the base where the seaweeds are attached to the rock. And so it didn't look that bad for rock weeds in the first few days after the heat wave. But if you continued to monitor, then you would realize how bad it was getting. And an undergraduate named Lara Calvo, who's been working in my lab, took these photos from where she works um, near Belcara. And this is her field site in um, sort of late spring, um, early summer before the heat wave. And there's the same site a few weeks after the heat wave. Um, I uh, have just gotten from her a photo. I haven't had time to add to this presentation, which shows sort of the up to the, the last week version of this. And most of this remaining rock wheat has also disappeared. So that damage that occurred during the heat wave um, uh, took longer to manifest in some species than others, but is, is really clear. And this is a gentle north facing beach. You would think this one would have been okay, but it was still hot up there to kill off a lot of this um, habitat forming seaweed. Um, how extensive were these die offs? Uh, this is a zoom in on that earlier heat wave image. And you can see there's some patterns in here. The Strait of Georgia was hot. The Strait of Juan de Fuca stayed a little bit cooler, even all the way into the west side of San Juan Island. And uh, of course, people went out and looked, and that includes scientists like me, but it also includes a lot of shellfish farmers and a lot of just concerned citizens who went out and looked. And with several colleagues, we're starting to compile all this information of where damage has been seen. So stay tuned for a manuscript on that. But a sort of quick overview of the observations are we know that things like clams and mussels died as far south as Hood Canal in southern Puget Sound. Uh, barnacles died as far north as some of these channels north of Bella Bella in British Columbia. And there was heavy mortality on shorelines throughout the Strait of Georgia. The Strait of Juan de Fuca was mostly okay. The west side of Calvert Island was mostly okay. Willapa Bay was mostly okay. Bamfield, I, I gave it the sort of frowny face because it wasn't as bad as Vancouver, for example, but there are still areas where there's unusually high mortality. Um, so I think this relates to whether or not it happened to be foggy um, on those three hot days or whether there was some um, wave action splash and spray to help keep things cool or not. All right, so how many animals died? This brings us to barnacles, which like mussels and like seaweeds are really good habitat for other things. Um, pictured in my hand, there are over 100 dead families. And so you can immediately guess, all right, if you can fit 100 dead barnacles in an area that small, uh, the shoreline is a lot bigger than the palm of my hand. There might be a lot. So it takes some very rough estimates. Um, we know that uh, there are roughly, and these numbers need to be refined, say 50 dead barnacles in a 10 by 10 centimeter plot. We know for a fact that you can fit 100 of those plots in a square meter. I'm estimating that there's about two square meters of barnacle habitat in a linear meter of shoreline. We know that there's a thousand meters in a kilometer. Um, uh, 2,500 kilometers is a guess of the shoreline for the Strait of Georgia, and 40% of that as barnacle habitat is a data-based conservative estimate of where barnacles might live. And if you multiply all those things together, you get really big numbers just for barnacles. And again, that's a preliminary estimate. The, the true value could be smaller, it could be larger, but that's just for the barnacles and hasn't included the mussels and, and all the things that live in those habitats. Not everything died though. I don't wanna leave you with that impression. 
Um, but there's patterns that we may not really appreciate uh, in terms of the outlook for the ecosystem because a lot of the species that survive are not native. Um, so the, uh, the uh, Japanese species of seagrass seem to do okay. This anemone is from uh, East Asia. That did fine. The Pacific oyster did fine. Mud snails also from Southern Japan did fine. These sponges are from warmer parts of Asia. This, uh, uh, the varnish clam, whatever it's called now. Um, Natalia uh, mostly did fine. These limpets are Japanese. They did fine. So there are going to be some winners, but it might not be our native species, which have not evolved to handle temperatures this high. Whereas species that you can also find in places like Hong Kong, where it really does get this hot regularly, didn't do as well. All right. So what are some of the effects going to be on the ecosystem? We really don't know. But here are things that I'm worried about. Surf scoters are migratory birds that rely on mussels in the winter as a food source. We don't know if they're going to have enough to eat this winter. There are hundreds of things that live in mussel beds and in rockweed beds. Um, we don't even have good counts of those before the heat wave, so we don't know what happened to them or how long it might take them to recover. Uh, a lot of things like intertidal seaweeds provide habitat for outmigrating salmon, which have other problems associated with high temperatures, you know, are there going to be effects there? We lost a lot of mussels. Is that going to affect water quality? We, we don't know yet. And in terms of longer term prospects, you know, I think the mussels are actually going to recover quickly because they make a bazillion babies and they can disperse really well. But some clams and some sea stars take a lot longer to, to uh, grow up and mature. And things like seaweeds don't always disperse very far. So those recoveries may take longer. And as for all those wee little things that occupy the mussel bed, boy, it was just guessing at this point. But what I am pretty confident in is that we are going to see more heat waves like this one. They will be more frequent and they will eventually, possibly soon, be more severe than the one we just had. And that is going to start to tip our system away from what it's been for our lifetimes, um, even the oldest among us. Um, and towards something that is going to be a really weird mix of British Columbia species, which are really hardy, maybe some things that naturally immigrate in from farther south, and then things that are arriving by accident from warmer parts of the world. So I think that is what we have to look forward to in the next few years. Uh, ecologists like my students and I are scrambling to um, get a handle on this event and what the longer term implications are. Um, so stay tuned. We're learning a lot as we go. Thanks so much, Chris. Wow, it sounds like you've done so much already and this just happened. We're curious, are there any organisms that can keep up? For example, will this die off lead to more heat resistant animals or adaptations or changes in behavior? Uh, excellent question. Um, what happens on a lot of coastlines in the world, and there's really good evidence for this in places like Western Europe um, and both coasts of Australia, is as things warm up, a lot of species that are sort of more equatorial slide towards the poles of so South and Australia and North and Europe. Um, and uh, so you will, you will start to see warmer water species, but you also get warmer water genotypes of the species that you already have. So some, you know, for example, Portuguese genotypes may show up in the UK of the same species or, you know, UK genotypes in, in Norway. In the Strait of Georgia, in the Salish Sea, say more generally, the challenge is that is a natural hotspot geographically. So to get other species or genotypes that are more warm adapted than what we already have, you have to go all the way to central California or further south than that. And the odds of dispersal against the prevailing current from that distance is pretty small. So we're, we're sort of stuck with the animals and the genotypes we have. And, you know, selection, I'm sure, is operating furiously and the genotypes that are currently better adapted are more likely to have survived. But I think we may be pretty close to the limits of what that can do in uh, the Salish Sea just because of this local context. Uh, and I think that's why we'll start seeing more of these, um, you know, species that, that uh, are native to places like Hong Kong taking off um, and filling in. So we may shift from mussel beds to oyster beds in, in the next decade or so. And so you mentioned that you've studied rocky shorelines since the mid 90s. Over your career, what are some of the greatest changes you've observed in coastal ecosystems, 
in addition to temperature changes? Oh, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the abiotic environment, um, temperature is probably the biggest one, but ocean acidification is another concern. Uh, and like temperature, there are you know, there's sort of the global scale pattern where we're dropping, um, you know, a few tenths of a pH unit, which doesn't sound like a big number, but actually is when you realize how much of a shift in acidity that represents. Um, but places like the entrance to the spray to Juan de Fuca, just because of the local oceanography, are acidifying faster. And some things are growing a little bit more slowly, uh, um, which is correlated with that. Whether that's causal um, is a little bit harder to know. Uh, but I, I haven't yet seen massive mortalities in the wild because of that. There have been massive mortalities of, say, oyster larvae in aquaculture facilities because of acidification. Um, changes in oxygen in deeper water are a concern. We're seeing expansions of dead zones. Um, microplastics are a hot topic right now. I think there's a growing awareness of how pervasive those are. Uh, there's all sorts of things we're doing to the environment that we might not have thought would be especially important. And now, you know, as with temperature, we're playing catch up. And because it's a whole big stew of these things changing at once, it's like, well, shoot, if it, the water's more acidic, does that lower your thermal tolerance and make a double whammy more likely to happen? It turns out in a lot of cases, yes. I was curious about the graph you showed of the muscle mortality and the angle of the sun, and that seems like really important information. Um, How is that being used in conservation efforts, or do you think it's applicable in any way? I think it is definitely applicable. Whether or not it's being used yet, I'm not sure. But what it suggests to me is that if uh, and this applies uh, to, you know, intertidal shores and would also apply to terrestrial landscapes. For um, <clears throat> coral reefs, there would be a different spin on it, but there's also heterogeneity on, you know, there's warmer areas on coral reefs and cooler areas on coral reefs. And maybe what we ought to be trying to protect are the areas that are thermally diverse, which seems weird because we focus so much on biologically diverse. But if we had said, wow, this one shoreline on Galliano is amazing, let's protect it, but the geology there is just flat, gently sloping rock. And so there were relatively few places to hide on some of those shores there, whereas um, Lighthouse Park, uh, you know, unlike the sandstone of Galliano, is more granitic, and so there's more, you know, north and south and east and west facing surfaces or boulder fields, you know, getting under rocks is even better. Uh, protecting those habitats, there might be more cool refuges where you can at least shelter uh, uh, some fraction of plants and animals, uh, even during a really bad heat wave. So that, that might be a good, good sort of thing to factor in when deciding where to set um, your protected areas is, are there cool refuges in that area or not? Because sooner or later, or now, uh, species are going to need those. This is heavy stuff. Um... What keeps you motivated or grounded in this work? And what advice would you give to other folks out there who feel really down about it? Yeah, I um, gave a presentation years ago before things got even worse. Uh, and one of the students in the audience uh, raised her hand and asked, how can you give such an upbeat presentation when all the news is so bad? And I said, well, I try to compartmentalize the sort of the problem solving ecological, you know, puzzle part of it, which I find really interesting from the depressing implications. And then another student raised his hand and said, so you're telling us you're pretty much dead inside. <laughs> and I hope that's not true. Um, but after this heat wave, it was tough. Uh, and in coming back from one of the worst hit field sites, I, I had the radio on in the car and that um, uh, the song Pompeii by Bastille was playing and the refrain is, how am I going to be an optimist about this? And I was thinking about that. Oh. It's like, I, I, we can't become incredibly pessimistic or we'll just throw up our hands and say, you know what, There's, it, it's too late. There's nothing we can do. And so staying positive in the face of calamity, I think is helpful. And one place that I get a lot of inspiration is actually from the number of people that have reached out with their concerns and observations. Another place that I get a lot of inspiration is from the response to the COVID pandemic, 
like climate change, that's a big, scary thing. And no individual is in control of that. But with COVID, we all, well, most of us stepped up and, you know, wore masks when we went grocery shopping and stood a little further apart and changed some things. And some of that was harder. And some of that actually was surprisingly easy. We can do similar things with climate change. And I love the bending the curve metaphor. I think we should absolutely apply that to climate change because that is not just some target down the road, you know, or some, you know, threshold we're trying to avoid. That is where we are right now. What can we be doing to just slow the rate and eventually sort of tip that back in the right direction? so that ecosystems have time to keep pace with the changes that we're putting them through. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Is there anything else before you go that you wanted to add that you that you think people have to know about this? I the thing out of this that has struck me the most in many ways is a comment that another UBC researcher named Simon Donner made when he was asked, is this the new normal? And he said, no, because there's no normal anymore. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that will be stable enough for the rest of our lives to get used to in terms of the climate. And that was really sobering. And uh, that, that does worry me, but I think that also should kindle a real fire uh, under our feet, you know, literally and figuratively to act now and, you know, make all the little changes, you know, the next time you need to buy an appliance, buy an energy efficient one. If you can telecommunicationally and not be in a car, that's awesome. Uh, if you eat your leftovers, that actually helps fight climate change. So there's lots of little things we can do. And I think it's really important that we treat this as the serious situation that it is, and then derive some satisfaction and pleasure from having risen to this challenge. So that's, that's my advice to people is to make this something that you can derive um, some good vibes from by doing good things for the environment, and then that will make it easier. And also vote for political parties that will help, help facilitate all that. Beyond individual actions, how would you suggest folks go um, go on about protecting areas that they're passionate about or care about in nature? Yeah, one one thing you can do, and and don't feel selfish or guilty about this, is just spend time in those areas because it well it'll make you happier. There's scientific research that shows that being outside improves our well being, so that's good. Um, but it also makes us love those areas and, and want to care for them. So I, I find that useful, like going for a hike, don't feel like that's a selfish activity. Um, but then there are local organizations you can join if there's you know, a particular park that you want to help clean up or remove in, invasive species from. There are all sorts of ways to, to get involved in doing those sorts of things. And then at sort of bigger scales, if you want to donate to organizations that are finding ways to mitigate climate change impacts, you know, plant trees, those sorts of things, um, you can uh, sort of put your money where your mouth is and then you can get involved as a volunteer or if you're um, you know, considering what career you might want to pursue, you can look into uh, options that would give you that sort of satisfaction of, of helping to make a difference. And there's lots of opportunity right now for those sorts of things. Even, you know, if you're an engineer, invent a cheaper solar panel. Um, lots of things that, uh, that are exciting right now, too, in addition to being a little bit depressing and scary. That's all for today, folks. Thanks for joining us. And thanks so much to all of our guests, too. We know this is a heavy subject, especially for folks who've already lost so much from heat waves and wildfires. We encourage you to talk about how you feel and what's going on in your own community to adapt to these new changes. Compartmentalizing is just one way people deal with the huge amount of emotions that come with these topics. The important thing is to recognize how you can process your emotions in a healthy way and then use them to fuel your own actions. Although we didn't have a chance to relay your questions live to our guests, please remember to still input any questions you may have in the Q&A so we can ask them during the podcast. Our next episode is Wednesday, September 15th, and it's going to be a highly interactive episode with Dr. Dave Riddell from Ocean Networks Canada, where we're going to discuss science communication and climate action. And who knows, we may even have a special celebrity cameo, so stay tuned for that. We'll also have a fast turnaround for another episode on September 22nd, where we'll have a special episode for Science Literacy Week and explore kelp forests in real time 
underwater with our amazing field trips team right here at BMSC. And as usual, we'll end this episode with our climate action recommendations for today. First up, what kind of public cooling spaces exist in your community? Some municipalities will set up misting stations in public parks or have free public pool days for folks that are vaccinated or in non-COVID hotspots. Check in with your local representatives to see what kinds of accessible options exist in your community. The second action is one Chris Harley's lab is spearheading and a way for folks on coasts to be involved in community science. Check out the link in our show notes for instructions on how you can collect data on barnacle populations using just your phone. This will help Chris and his lab have a better spatial understanding of barnacle populations. Finally, you may have heard that there's going to be a snap election at the end of September. 350 Canada is organizing a day of community mobilization across the country on September 8th to push political parties to put urgent climate action at the top of their agendas. Just last week, over 400 individuals showed up to their organizing call to commit to an action in their own communities. And you can bet we even registered an action right here in Bamfield. Check out their website in the show notes or look at 350.org slash still on fire to register or join an action near you. We need leaders who prioritize real climate action now. So this is your chance to keep the public pressure on to enact change. And finally, before we go, please indulge me as I torture our production technician with my favorite tide pool joke. Hey, George. What? <laughs> what did one tide pool say to the other? Want to see my muscles? He loves it. All right, that's it, folks. And we'll see you next time, September 15th. <laughs>